Okay, so let's continue with the second panel. Uh, indeed, as you said, Irene, COVID-19 is still with us and still impacting on our daily lives. Intersex people, as you already said, as many of you already said, are among the most vulnerable parts of the population in our society. And the COVID reports we just listened to show how the situation of intersex people is being aggravated as a result of the COVID-19 and the ongoing pandemic. Uh, we have invited to talk about this five activists from across the globe to shed some light on the impact today, one year and a half later, um, after the pandemic started. So I'm very happy to welcome Elian Rubashkin. Elian is an intersex pharmacist and human rights activist, currently working as intersex program officer for ILGA Ward. Elian is a co-founder of Rainbow Path, an organization providing peer support to LGBTQ plus refugees and asylum seekers in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, we also have Crystal. Crystal Hendricks is the chair of Intersex South Africa. As a black person, intersex person, Crystal believes it is essential that the voices of intersex people be heard and that they are, they are at the center of conversations and decisions related to them. Thanks, Crystal, to, for being here. We also have Heike Cho, is the chair of Intersex Asia, and we already heard from Heike in the first panel. Uh, Heike became a pioneer of the intersex, uh, Asian intersex human rights movement when initiating the Global Free Hugs with Intersex Movement in 2010. We also have Manuela Falzone. Manuela is an Italian intersex activist and member of Intersex Esiste, founded in 2016. The organization's name emphasizes that if people learn more about intersex and intersex people, the social pressure to modify children's bodies will decrease. And finally, we have Mauro Cabral Grispan, um, who is an Argentinian trans and intersex advocate and executive director of GATE. He was a signatory of the Yogyakarta principles and a key driver in the expansion of these principles. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I will ask you some questions and we will have in total 35 minutes approximately. Uh, I would like to start with Crystal, with the first question. Is Crystal pinned? So my first question for Crystal is, um, the African COVID-19 survey showed the negative impact the ongoing pandemic has had on intersex activism in the region, but also showed the strength and the incredible resilience of intersex persons in Africa in such tough times. So I would like you to elaborate on this. Please tell us how your activism in South Africa has changed during the pandemic. Crystal, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure being here and seeing all these beautiful faces. Uh, um, I wish it was in person, but you know, this is the new way of the new business as usual. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's been a really, um, you know, a crazy year and a half, um, you know, since the pandemic started. Um, and we've seen a lot of changes, especially in South Africa, you know, I think we just recently went through our third wave and we've just recently um, went to a stage two, a lower level of lockdown. Um, and it's really been difficult, you know, like the survey showed, um, you know, even as we did a survey just in South Africa um, as well. Um, and, you know, the, the survey showed that the main things that intersex people were struggling with was employment. We found that a number of intersex people in South Africa were unemployed. Um, the other two main ones was access to healthcare and also then dealing with mental health issues. Um, I think the only way we could address during this pandemic, because we couldn't physically meet one another, um, we had to put a lot of things that was on our work plan on hold, or we had to put our strategic plan on hold, everything changed, you know, because there was just no um, contact um, with people, um, and because of this, we focused more on our members, um, because of the pandemic and, you know, people were at home, people were more isolated from the community, um, because we are aware a lot of intersex people um, are not themselves, you know, when they are at home, sometimes they have to put on a mask or they have to pretend to be someone else. Um, but it's that moment when intersex people are together that when they can find that freedom, when they can, they can be themselves. 
Um, so we saw a lot of intersex people struggling, you know, with the isolation and being alone. So in South Africa, you know, what we did, we tried um, to have as much online activities, even if it is on WhatsApp, WhatsApp calls. Um, we tried to do lots of Zoom calls with our members. This was very difficult um, because of we could even see now <laughs> we were having problems um, and just some areas within Africa, so Africa just doesn't have the infrastructure to host, you know, online meetings. And it was really difficult, but yet we still had to attempt, you know, in order to make sure um, that we engage with our members. Um, in South Africa, we we offered our members, you know, a lot of um, core support regarding essential things, you know, essential things just to get by, um, you know, just to survive. Um, and we try to, you know, meet all the needs as much as possible as an organization. Um, I think for us, we had a really good experience with our donors because most of our funding was core funding um, and we didn't have any, you know, struggles when reaching out to donors and say, so this was on our work plan, however, our members need food, so we need to provide our members, you know, with food, um, we need to provide them with, you know, groceries, with um um, anything that they might need medically, if it's money for medication, and you know our donors were really were really supportive during this period, and we could really um support you know our members within South Africa, um, and I think that that was really essential to make sure that people you know um are surviving, and now that I'm thinking you know it's a year and a half later, currently um South Africa is on a stage two lockdown, and we actually have a in-person members, um, general members meeting for next month in October. And we're still hoping that it's going to happen because you know at any moment they can be uh, a fourth wave and we go back to, you know, a harsher um, lockdown and it could just be cancelled. Um, but in South Africa now, we are really excited, you know, to be seeing all our members next month. Um, I think another positive from the pandemic as well is that because we were all virtually, um, I feel that, you know, there was a lot of visibility with, with social media, because obviously, you know, that was the new way of doing things because um, we couldn't meet in person. We were active on social media, um, a lot of media, you know, interviews and also with the Olympics and the Casta Semenya case. It just brought a lot of visibility in South Africa around intersex people. And because of that visibility, we've also found a lot of um, new members, you know, reaching out and saying, hey, I'm intersex, I'm from this area in this area and you know when we're going to have our meeting hopefully next month we'll have seven additional you know intersex people in South Africa joining that meeting and for me that's probably the best thing that that could have come from this pandemic you know just to make sure that we are reaching out you know and reaching intersex people you know and developing them as well um currently in South Africa we are also in process of starting with you know some litigation so we've gotten some affidavits you know from our members um, regarding IGM and we're really trying to pursue you know um, um, a case on our side and which is it's new it's very scary it's very, you know it's really scary but I, I think it's the right time um, and at the moment we have a lawyer that has come to um, into South Africa and has offered these services pro bono um, for us to start this this litigation and I feel like we are in such a good place um, to really take the movement, you know, in South Africa and also to even, you know, have a model for when this reaches in the entire Africa. So, you know, what, what we learn, what we experience, our struggles, you know, that, that can be implemented, you know, across our entire region, you know, as a whole. Um, so I'm really proud, um, you know, for this entire movement. And I think that, it, it's still going to be difficult because, I mean, obviously we are saying there, there might be a, a fourth wave and um, with vaccinations, you know, it's really being rolled out and people are now starting to go for vaccinations. And so things are easing up. Um, but I'm really positive regarding intersex activism in Africa or inside Africa as a whole, um, because I feel even though it was so difficult throughout the entire pandemic, 
the voice of intersex people was still very loud during this pandemic. And intersex people ensured that, you know, we will not be silenced, we will not be erased, and, you know, we will not be isolated from communities. And like we said, you know, nothing about us without us. And that is very true for Africa, um, is that we are really trying to raise a very strong voice for intersex activism in Africa. And also just thank you so much for everyone um, that has been supporting the African intersex um, movement as well. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very, very much, Crystal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing some issues, but also the amazing support work uh, you have been doing and th th the organization has been doing in the country. Thank you. Uh, I'm moving to the second panelist. Um, I have a question for uh, Manuela. Can you hear me, Manuela? Uh, yes, can you perfect. hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, the European COVID-19 survey um, by OI Europe shows the large negative impact the ongoing pandemic has on mental health of intersex people and on intersex activism as well, as Dan uh, already shared with us previously. Uh, my question is, can you tell us a bit more about the situation in Italy? The floor is yours. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm going to speak especially about activism, and uh, I would like to say that my answer will not just be negative. Of course, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were a little lost. Uh, in particular, I was disappointed when I had to cancel an event I had been working hard on for six months. Uh, it was an important seminar aimed at medical students that was missed due to the pandemic and which unfortunately could not longer be repeated. Uh, also the organization of public initiatives to steer public opinion has been uh, prevented. And for example, uh, I tried to organize a public event to celebrate uh, the Intersex Awareness Day last October. Uh, but it was impossible, uh, as all live public meeting initiatives were uh, prohibited. Another important point uh, must also be said that uh, having been unable to meet live for a long time, the emotional impact uh, of the experience of meeting other intersex people has been lost, uh, increasing the feeling uh, of being alone and isolated. Uh, I know uh, that the research that uh, has been conducted has highlighted uh, important problems like these, uh, but I would like also to highlight some positive aspects. Uh, first, as for the activity of my group, we struggled at first with the digital means available, first of all, Zoom, which we did not know how to use before and which we have learned to use due to the emergency. Uh, but there have been advantages in this new way of doing things. In fact, uh, we have saved time and money by not having to pay for transportation and renting uh, meeting uh, places. Uh, we were then able to organize online training uh, seminars, uh, both uh, at LGBTI Association and one for uh, psychology students of the University of Palermo in Sicily. Uh, we have noticed that the new digital dimension has uh, favored greater participation of people uh, in the initiatives. This is in particular uh, occurred during the national forum we held in October 2020 uh, organized by our group to bring together all the groups uh, that deal uh, with intersex in Italy. And uh, this uh, large uh, participation also took place uh, during the autumn meeting of AISIA support group, uh, I mean uh, autumn of uh, 2020. Uh, one negative factor I'm noticing now is the fact that many people have gotten used to virtual dating, uh, got lazy, and now struggle to get back to face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, 
Uh, in these days, uh, a meeting of uh, AISIA support group uh, is underway, uh, which unfortunately will see a minimum participation. Also, because the meeting is not online anymore. I think that uh, this is a, a common factor uh, also in the world of work uh, and uh, in the near future, uh, um, activism um, have to, uh, will have the opportunities, we have the opportunity to learn how to use both digital media and live meetings uh, uh, wisely. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, your attention and the short. Thank you, Manuela. That was very interesting. Thank you for highlighting some negative aspects like isolation and physical distance, but also uh, some positive aspects like new opportunities in virtual environments and saving costs. And good luck with your work at national level in Italy. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. I'm now moving to Hiker. Uh, which we we'll listened to in the first panel. Uh, welcome again, Heike. Um, my question for you is, is the following. So Intersex Asia has been doing lots of online events uh, during the pandemic and also has a successful fellowship program. Can you please tell us uh, something more about it and how your activism has changed during this pandemic? Thank you, Heike. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Okay. I, I, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, yes, you know, Intersex Asia actually is a very young organization since 2018. So our goal is kind of create a space, uh, create a possibility to, to create an intersex movement in Asia because I was a uh, alone in Asia before, but that, so I really want to create, you know, more uh, intersex organization in this region so we can move on together. And uh, so at, after we uh, we started, uh, we, uh, we faced COVID-19. It is quite challenging because we cannot meet each other that, you know, easily. So, uh, so we have to develop different kind of uh, capacity uh, that we that we were, we are we were not familiar before. Actually, before we are a, only a group uh, from Asia, so not a team. But you know, um, the COVID nineteen actually uh, brings us to get more together. Uh, really thankful for the you know internet because although we cannot meet in person but uh, we have internet to connect us together. So actually it helped us, you know, to connect each other more uh, than before. Before, the, uh, before COVID, actually we didn't connect that much uh, through internet. And uh, because, you know, in Asia, uh, uh, intersex activists uh, and, and the, you know, um, community in Asia, we don't could really communicate that much because language barrier because our uh, English is not our native native languages but we have to use English to communicate to each other so it's a uh, kind of very uh, hesitating for everyone but uh, when the COVID nineteen come uh, and also it is uh, intersex Asia you know it has to go going on right so we have to communicate. So I think, you know, this uh, COVID-19, yeah, uh, separate us uh, very far away from each other, but in another way, more closer to each other. And our uh, English, I think we, are, our English are all improving some way. Yeah, I hope you can feel that <laughs> from my talk. And, uh, Yes, uh, so you know, for a new organization in a you know uh, region that has very less intersex uh, organization and activists uh, for us, uh, our first uh, job is to um, reach out to community, to create community, and you know connect community. So you know, so that's why we. Uh, you know, need to, you know, we need to learn uh, much more to uh, communicate online. 
to help the you know intersex community here and the world uh, you know to learn you know to aware our existence and to know that there is an intersex uh, uh, network organization in Asia so people can uh, join together to you know to talk about our issue to share our issue together. So we have, uh, you know, in the in the beginning we had a translation project uh, to translate the two key uh, uh, intersex uh, 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 document for intersex people here. One is UN intersex fashion. Another one is uh, uh, our first uh, uh, Asian uh, intersex statement. Uh, we want to. Uh, you know, through the translation, we want to reach more intersex people in different countries. So now we have been uh, translated uh, more than uh, 13 uh, different languages in Asia uh, in these two documents. Uh, but still, they are, they are actually there are thousands of uh, language, different languages here in Asia. So uh, it's a uh, far way to go. But I think it did uh, it did help in you know to, for us to uh, gather more people. And uh, last year we started uh, our first uh, um, intersex uh, intersex uh, um, fellowship program uh, because you know incubate intersex activists uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to you know create more intersex. Uh, organization in Asia in each country uh, are our goal because we want the we want voice from uh, the grass grassroots rebel from the ground in Asia you know to speak for themselves I cannot speak for all right so we need to you know uh, incubate more people and we learn from them and we help them to speak so we can gradually you know revise our uh, Asia's uh, intersex statement to a more you know uh, uh, suitable one, more con, you know, uh, more uh, proper one that you know fit to the co context of Asia. We you know we want to explore more uh, specific uh, issue of intersex people in Asia. So you know, uh, we can uh, join join the web movement. Uh, you know, on behalf of Asia, uh, this is uh, what we are doing. And so you know because we cannot really meet each other that much, especially this year. Last year we did try, uh, we did try, you know, to host uh, uh, three uh, community meeting in three country. But this year uh, we can only go, uh, go on, you know, online. So for now, no, no, uh, no meeting in person, uh, right, uh, until now. But uh, still we are, con but it, you know, it makes us connect each other more because, uh, for example, like our board member of uh, in the intersex Asia, we you know used to meet online every week. Uh, then, <clears throat> because COVID nineteen actually is very you know very stressful, so we um, we now we meet twice a week. So, uh, but you know, but gradually we I feel you know this uh, pressure you know makes us uh, a team, not only a group. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can work together uh, more, you know, uh, in this, you know, uh, synchronization is, is it the word? Yeah, yeah. like, uh, yeah, so we can, so, so we can work together uh, more uh, smoothly and, uh, you know, grow, you know, uh, our organization uh, to a uh, more stable one. So for, we are very grateful, uh, even though we have uh, we faced the uh, COVID-19, but uh, um, we, you know, we are lucky uh, to, you know, start Intersex Asia before COVID-19 because uh, we did raise our farm and we did uh, use some farm to uh, start up, uh, initiate as a, a, a general fund support to our community. And it is really helpful because in Asia, uh, small money actually can uh, help a lot, uh, especially for people in the rural area. Yeah, so um, this is, uh, yeah, even after a year, I think, uh, this COVID nineteen actually bound us to, uh, mm -hmm. tighter together. Uh, we drew started to like uh, form uh, a, a, a you know a bigger community uh, here in Asia, and we we believe that uh, we do uh, 
we 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 will have uh, you know uh, we will have a better uh, interest movement in Asia uh, gradually. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Haiga, and congratulations. Yeah, I think it's great that you um, are using these times as an opportunity to create new connections. And congrats for your translation project, your fellowship program. Uh, as you said, it's great to incubate new intersex activists and voices. So good luck. Um, I'm, I'm now moving to Elian. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes, okay, so, perfect. So welcome again. Um, you have done some amazing support work for fellow intersex activists in Latin America. And so my question for you is, can you please share a bit about this experience? Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say I, because I don't want to make it I, I would say as a collective, uh, we've been very great in helping, finding ways to help. And um, yeah, I mean, Latin America is a region that um, we might know. Um, it's a region that has a lot of inequalities and those inequalities and asymmetries that are very prevalent in our society create situations in which those that are less able are actually at, at the brink of even in situations of death. So COVID-19 came and it's starting to hit us very badly. And when it's starting to hit us very badly, many of us, particularly babies, particularly babies born with congenital hydrogen hyperplasia, were dying because the medications that we, would, we were repurposing for treating COVID-19 patients, such as hydrocortisone, uh, actually, you know, was out of stock. So, babies needing that urgent medication were not able anymore to access that medication. So babies were simply going and dying. Um, it is very sad for me to say that I, I actually was accompanying two of these babies that are not here anymore. Um, and at the same time, we were trying to find ways into how to help another fellow activist Another fellow activist that was struggling, it was struggling because it's not just because of the pandemic, but the situation, you know, in, in his country was particularly complex. So I kind of starting with this kind of like, you know, we have to do something. This person is very, you know, it's, this person is about to die. Uh, so we actually came all together and we we make a fundraise and we managed to get some funds to, you know, get him sorted. I mean, I'm on many other things for this person. Um, the, 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 the biggest thing was just to kind of like realize that this person was actually struggling because he didn't have enough food, you know, like food, like pretty much like that was kind of like the main reasons why this person was struggling. So, uh, but other reasons, medical neglect, like a medical neglect for like decades and decades of neglection. And this person was experiencing even a, a condition that is not even, I mean, it's a condition that only people that has been neglected for decades of a, a condition and treated. And then this person was developing this condition just for neglection. So it was very painful for me to see that suffering, but at the same time, I decided to organize myself, organize knowledge, organize all this energy and I started to say, listen, I can find connections and networks and I can find ways to make sure that people in a country can get their medication, no matter how, what pandemic is going on. I can make sure that no matter where you are, if you are in the Amazon rainforest in Peru, or if you are in Cochabamba, Bolivia, you can get your bloody medication if that's what needs you to keep you alive. And that's what I did. And it worked. It worked. We managed to save 12 human lives. And I've been keeping this very quiet and secretly because I don't want to brag on this because this is a collective effort. It's been very, very painful to see the kind of pain that has been coming from all this work and being seeing people dying in and people suffering and people struggling is very painful. But I'm proud that as a fucking pharmacist, finally, I'm helping my community. 
Because I was thinking my profession was the most useless profession in the world. I was I, how can as a pharmacist, I try to help my community, my people, me, myself. You know, if I'm part of the bad group, you know, I'm a part of the medical professionals that pathologize our existence. But at the end of the day, we managed to make a difference. We managed to maybe change a little bit. We managed to create a group which is called the FOSI, which is the Fund for, um, for uh, Intersex Solidarity. And Outright has given us some funding. So I'm, I don't have to use my wages anymore. I can finally use, you know, assistance in another ways. And with Brujula Intersexual, we are actually finding ways to keep going and to see how can we go, you know, finally battling these injustices and finally, you know, from this end, trying to help our community. Yeah, thank you, Renan. Thank you, Alien. It is indeed very painful, as you said, to hear from these stories but also congrats um, for this amazing support work for the community, for your energy and for this collective effort. Thank you. Um, I'm now moving to the last but not least panelist, uh, Mauro Cabral Grispan. Mauro, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Perfect. So my question for you is this one. Um, the pandemic has moved many events online and you have been successfully speaking at many of these virtual events. Um, can, you tell, uh, can you tell us how has your activism in Argentina and beyond changed during the pandemic? Also from that point of view, um, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. I don't know if I will say successfully. I have been speaking like many of you in different panels. And to be honest, uh, the opportunity of connecting with activists and to hear and see the wonderful work that everyone is doing have saved my life during the pandemic. I think that many of you have been part of my close community and I really admire of resilience of all of us around the world, able to connect once and again and once and again through Zoom. Uh, something that many of us, well, including my, I will talk about myself, realize over this time is how important it has been to be able to meet over the years and just to share experiences in person. So for those of you that have devoted time in developing different strategies to keep the conversation going on, I have to appreciate that, that effort. In our case in Argentina, um, the pandemic was a time of challenge, but also a time of opportunity because it allowed people, some of those people are, are here in the call as well, to, to connect more regularly Argentina is a really big country. It's difficult to meet in person, but with the pandemic, we were forced to meet and actually to produce different uh, documents, videos, and we even managed to introduce a law bill at the parliament. So it's, it's a law uh, on the comprehensive protection on sex characteristics. So in that sense, even when personal and political relationships can be challenged by the pandemic, uh, we can have an extremely productive time in our movement. And what we have seen is that many activists that just started to do activism by the end of, or by the beginning of 2020, um, now they are fully integrated, not only in the national movement, but also in the regional and the international movement. So I'm extremely proud by the, the, the power of our community in, in Argentina and also in Latin America. But you know that I'm also the executive director of an international organization and there the situation has been the opposite because our work, gay work on intersex issues has been historically focused on <clears throat> the international classification of diseases and processes around depathologizing intersex. And the World Health Organization has almost disappeared from a radar because they have moved all their interest 
for you know many issues including intersex issues to be focused on the pandemic and the people that we, we used to work with now they are working with uh different departments so it means that there is a lot going on nationally there is a lot going on regionally and as alien said we are a region with many challenges but also with a huge capacity for collective work but internationally and especially in regard to intersex pathologization the pandemic has produced a huge delay in the process with everything related with the world uh, the world health um, organization in my personal case um, for me um, I had a, a quite privileged experience through the pandemic because I had a job and also I didn't get COVID, but at the same time, my partner and, and I spent a year without seeing uh, each other. And right now I'm in Argentina and they is in Brussels. So, and, and that has an impact in my work and in my life as an intersex person and as an intersex activist, because it means that a key a uh, person in my support system is missing. I know that that's a situation of many other many other people, and and in that sense, the pandemic has been extremely triggering in terms of what happens if I am sick. What happens if I am sick and alone? What if I am sick and I have to take my intersex body to see a doctor and my partner or my family or my friends, my community are not around around me. Um, I have to appreciate the huge support system created by activists in, in Argentina, the way in which we have show up to it or for each other. I don't know how to, to say that. So I would say that the pandemic has, in my perspective, and I'm, I'm old or older than many other people in the room and have been doing activism by my own for a long time. The pandemic has shown me the, the power of a community that wasn't there before the pandemic and that is there now. So I will, this is the end of what I have to, to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mauro. It is indeed interesting to learn about the, the process, the new achievements at national level and regional level, good luck with the, the low bill and yeah and on the international level let's hope the the pathologization process is not further delayed so thank you very much to all uh, of my uh, to all of our panelists um we are heading towards the, the end of this panel um thank you for participating thank you for you know sharing the struggles but also the great resilience and strength of intersex people around the globe. It was very interesting. And I think we can all learn from these examples. Thank you.